Okay, um, we're live. Welcome to Boston Basic Income. I'm Alex Howlett. This week we are talking about power dynamics, uh, social and political power dynamics, and how they interact with basic income. So how does basic income shift the social and political power dynamics of a country, the United States? Um, also an interesting question is, how do power dynamics affect whether we're even going to get a basic income in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, and these two things are related to each other because if the people in power do not feel threatened by the basic income or they're not worried that they're going to lose their power, uh, then they're more likely to be accepting of a basic income. Uh, so some of us read an article by uh, G. William Donhoff. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote a book called uh, Power in America. Um, so He's got this whole website that's kind of like excerpts from his book, but updated and stuff like that. Uh, he's he's a, a professor of uh, in the sociology department at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Um, interesting. He, his writing is, is is interesting a little bit, kind of uh, off the mainstream. Uh, so so this article is called "The Class Domination Theory of Power." Um, so I guess I'll start. Uh, we have uh, Alex and Richard here. Um, I'll start by asking you guys. Um, how do you think uh, basic income affects social and political power dynamics, or what's the relationship there? Um, my, my first uh, thought was, like you alluded to in the beginning, which was that, you know, like the degree to which it's going to be easy to, to actually get it is going to depend uh, largely on, what, or not largely, but going to depend somewhere on you know, whether those in power think it's going to benefit them or not. And also whether exactly how that power system works is going to depend, it's going to sort of like make a difference in terms of like um, how you would go about doing that and, and whether you actually agree with the thesis put, put forward here, which I think is pretty convincing. So, but um, yeah, there's a lot of different things related to that that are at play, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Richard. Well, it's possible that sometime in like next decade that the pitchforks are coming so that to ward off the pitchforks, they're more likely to introduce a basic income. And it, for unions, it's, it would provide it, um, a strike fund that they wouldn't be, they could continue on indefinitely with their strikes. So it's, it goes both ways. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. It goes both ways. I've heard um, some people who are skeptical of basic income uh, expressing concern that uh, ex expressing concern that um, basic income can be used as a tool by the powerful to placate those who don't have any power. Um, so it's a tool to kind of hold on to their power and prevent. Uh, the the people with the pitchforks from coming and overthrowing them, that kind of thing. Um, I think, you know, there's some truth to that story. Obviously, if um, people are less desperate um, and they're suffering less, they're less likely to rise up because, you know, they're, they're more okay. Um, I think that's, that's generally, I think that's actually a good thing, right? Um, if, if people are able to live the lives they want to live and you know, uh, have more prosperity, less poverty, then what's happening is the people who are in power are making decisions that are compatible with, with human prosperity, with the prosperity of ordinary people. Um, so that feels like something that's, um, that's probably okay, at least in some ways. Um, but I think, you know, Richard is right that, um, that it also goes the other way, that um, the basic income can give ordinary people uh, more power. Um, and you know you can you can look specifically at, at kind of like the worker relationships as, as Richard was pointing out where um, workers have more negotiating power because they, they have an outside option and, and they can choose not to be workers or not to be workers at that company or, or go on strike or that kind of thing um, I think that's that's certainly something that's true I like to emphasize thinking of people as as people um, more than just thinking of them as workers um, so so the idea um, the idea that basic income gives people the power to choose not to be workers, rather than gives workers the power to 
to um, kind of negotiate with their employers. So instead of thinking of people as workers and, and giving the workers the power, you're thinking of people as people, and you're giving them the power to decide whether they want to be workers or who they want to work for, if they want to work, that kind of thing. Uh, initial thoughts on power yeah. dynamics. Yeah. Great question. I mean, I think it definitely gives people a lot more power. So one of the things with bargaining power, which you've been talking about, yeah. um, it gives everyone a certain amount of bargaining power in the workplace. It might give people more access to like free time, which could, which is also a powerful thing to have. If you're really strung out all the time, you're cognitively loaded. They've, they've studied this with their like, poverty, but also you just don't have any time. It's hard to like participate in, in politics or donate to any campaigns or have any kind of a voice. I think. Um, on the flip side, I guess the thing that it doesn't solve, which we've talked about a little bit in here before is it doesn't solve like the concentration of an extreme ratio of money at the top relative to other people in the hands of a few individuals. And so that is, I'm not saying, I don't think the basic income makes that that much worse, but that doesn't really get solved by it. And that can still be, I think, dangerous in terms of a few individuals having enough money to have a large sway on politics or other aspects of society that you wouldn't necessarily want them to have a large sway on. So basic income on its own doesn't. Yep. solve that and it could even fuel it a little I guess if it just makes the society more prosperous to yeah. spend more money it's kind of like flowing to the top and then and then that brings up a couple of questions which is uh, one is to what extent uh, is power a zero-sum kind of thing and under under what circumstances yeah um, so you know does giving uh, uh, ordinary people more power necessarily take power away from from the people who have power now, the rich people who have power now. And I think to some extent it does. Um, and But to some extent it depends on uh, what you're talking about having power over. Um, and I think uh, this actually gets into the, to the article, um, which is how he defines uh, power, which is um, by power, I mean the capacity of some persons to produce intended and foreseen effects on others. This is a very general definition that allows for the many forms of power that can be changed from one to another, such as economic power, political power, military power, ideological power, and intellectual power, i.e. knowledge and expertise. It leaves open the question of whether force or coercion is always lurking somewhere in the background in the exercise of power, as many definitions imply. Uh, one thing he so one thing that's not included in this definition is is maybe the power to control your own life and the freedom to do what you want with your time um, without you know necessarily affecting what other people do. Yeah. yeah, that's because this is written in like two thousand one or nineteen seventy six, I think it was, and that wasn't even. On the radar back then? Well, maybe 1976, but um, 2001. This was updated in 2012, like most recent version. Yeah, I mean, he updates it like every six or ten years or something like that. Yeah. I think for me, I would find it useful to separate those concepts by maybe using a word yeah. like freedom for the freedom to do what you want and power for these things that have to do with interpersonal dynamics, just because otherwise it becomes like such a broad yeah. concept. Yeah. So it's interesting how he defines it. That said, the way he defines it, it's not entirely clear that it is zero sum because you could imagine like a, a more chaotic society where people are not really able to produce intended effects even in kind of across the board as much as a more like a more sort of predictable society where people are able to have like predictable influences on each other. You could also imagine a society in which people's interests are very much aligned. Yeah. So they all want each other to do certain things. So in a sense, they're all powerful because they all want to do the things everyone else yeah, wants to do. Yeah, that's a good do. point. Yeah. It really depends about on conflict, of it, whether they, how much conflict right. there is. Yeah. Right. And there's also like the great hack. Remember that movie we covered it a little bit a couple of months ago? Was that trailer? Facebook? The Great Hack. The it's a US it's a movie and, uh, on, um, on Netflix. Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica. Or uh -huh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that can greatly influence things. And then there's like Bloomberg and Steyer, where they can like buy the election sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the things that we're most concerned about are the cases where there's conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, 
No, we can also think about how can we like create less conflict of interest, which I think is also a really important question. And yeah. that's kind of your jam, which I think is good. Yeah. Um, and how does how does basic income do that? Yeah. 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 But there's always going to be some things that there's conflict of interest over, and so that's why I guess I bring up like this question of maybe political power coming from buying power, coming from having a lot more money than everyone else. Like mm-hmm. I can't. Im- I, it's hard for me to imagine that there would be like zero conflict of interest between those people and just. People in general, yeah. such that you would, we would be okay with them having like such an outsized influence. And there's also the question of you know like power isn't the only thing that people want, right? Uh, so we can ask the question: uh, To what extent is power a priority for those who are in power, or or for other people? Um, you know, if you can be um, just as wealthy as you are now, uh, have just as much freedom, but now you live in a safer world because there's no poverty and crime and war and stuff like that. Uh, would you give up a little bit of your political power for that? And is part of the reason why you want political power or social power because you are afraid of losing what you have? And if you're not afraid of that as much anymore, are you going to be more cooperative? That kind of thing. It's a good question. Yeah. I think there's two. I guess I wasn't even thinking about the motive of like seeking power for its own sake. Which right. some people do that too, and they like get into that. Yes. But because um, <laughs> it's like, I mean, I have my own like background academically about why that is. But I wasn't even really thinking about that. I was thinking about people wanting power as a means to an end. Yeah. And so I think that's where the conflicts of interest come in. Like, the more the Koch brothers or whoever it is, Bill Gates, whoever thinks that they have like things that they would want that wouldn't naturally happen without them having this power. You know they're going to want it as a means to an end, right. and I think that's true of just about every everybody. Um, sure, or a means to security. Just knowing that <laughs> by having power, you have insurance, so that if yeah. there's if, if something isn't going the way you want, you know you can kind of steer yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. the House of Cards is all about that with Francis Underwood. He wants mm. all he wants political power because <laughs> it's more it's worth more worthwhile to him than. Uh, monetary power, which the like the corporations and things pay him to do certain things to do mm-hmm. yeah. for. Yeah, that's yeah, it. it I think, uh, one of the things I got out of this article yeah. is the um, the kind of like I guess you might call it like path dependence the way the United States came to to this particular distribution of power <laughs> that we have that. That the, that the guy points out compared to say Europe and right. Right. that kind of thing, and that suggests to me that it the way most people think about power, especially those in the elite, that it is very much a um, they don't in general have this view that you know you just said, which is the sort of like well, if we're all you know if we're if we're all sort of more secure, then you know you have a lot less of these other sort of things you have to worry about. Like right. whereas like so, I can imagine that if you did. I think initially, I can imagine if you did bring a basic income in, at least initially, especially if it wasn't like that, maybe even like a you know fairly more more of like gangs that may not make a big bit of a difference, and therefore it would be sort of maybe viewed favorably and as a kind of way like Richard said of kind of like you know, avoiding pitchforks. But you can imagine that if you had a calibrated income as it went up, and then you may not so the people in power who have benefited from, you know, whatever, cheap labor or whatever might all of a sudden be going, hang on, this is, you know, I don't, you know, this is sort of like, you know, would they really let that, you know, quote unquote, let that happen? Mm-hmm. And that's something, an open question. That, that's, that's always my thinking when I wrote, think about the, like, you could have as many intellectual arguments, you could win the intellectual argument about whether facing up is a good thing and would be an ultimate good thing, but in order to make an actual policy, you have to you have to confront this kind of power. Yeah, yeah, just, I just can't see any way around it, unfortunately. Yeah. You either have to confront the power and find and find a way to to neutralize it or something like that, or um, you have to find a way to convince them and actually believe that uh, it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt them. It's not gonna make them more. Trojan horse people, basically. What's just that? Like Trojan horse people. Like I think because uh, I think you're saying it might actually be against some people's interests, and then how do you deal with that? I'm saying that I, gen- I generally don't think it would be. Uh, so it's a matter for for me. It's not a matter of tricking anybody. It's a matter of like showing showing them like, hey, this is going to be great on. for you. Hold on. Hold okay. On. Right. But you would say that your calibrated basic income would not be that good, at least in the short term, for like people who are like hedge fund managers or like there's a huge financial sector that you expect to crash with the way that you would do it. 
So like, wouldn't those people be opposed unless you're basically just Trojan horsing them because they don't like really foresee that consequence or like think about it the way you do? Yeah. yeah. So, so let's say you're an investment banker. Right. Um, First of all, you're already probably miserable with your life because it's <laughs> <laughs> your lives. Okay, somebody, uh, invested, so in, so somebody invested in it then. Maybe they're not the banker, but they're like getting the, the returns off of it. Or like, There's a lot of people uh, who are happy with the big financial sector. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there are people who have investments well, you know, retirement. But the people with the, who are already ha- who are making a decent amount of income, with the basic income, they would invest more in the financial sector. So they, they, the investment bankers or whatever might see that as to their advantage. Uh, I, I don't think that's quite right, uh, because what would end up happening is as you raise the basic income, the, um, the Fed would, would increase interest rates uh, to keep, keep the level of spending stable, to keep the, the prices stable. Uh, you might see that the people who are investing, I mean, what you would see is the people who are investing, um, they'll start shifting more of their investments into these, you know, government government bonds and stuff that pay higher higher interest than they used to, that kind of thing. Um, but there's also a lot of uh, a lot of people who borrow in order to invest. So there's investment that's funded by borrowing. So if you if you cut off the the lending by by offering, uh, you know. Offering the sale of government debt, uh, then that then that kind of cuts off that uh, kind of uh, chain of, of borrowing, funding, lending, funding, borrowing, funding, more lending, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So you see, you would see a shrinking in the financial sector. Yeah. I kind of also wonder if, sort of going back to your point about the, you know, whether it would sort of be against their interests and whether you could make, make you know, they could be convinced to yeah. realize there's no alignment. Like, and this is like the other thing that I kind of got this article is the kind of like talk about like the socialization of the process by which people sort of get into these kinds of you know they have he has a nice thing about the country clubs and all that stuff it's kind of amusing but sort of like like i wonder if part of this is part of the reason it's difficult is that people are just sort of it's not like most of the people in this elite are really sort of consciously thinking about their place in this structure and, and sort of like Analyzing like the sort of like how it all fits together and kind of that kind of thing. They're just kind right. of like they're just kind of used to it and sort of like you're sort of saying and they're just they're swimming in this cognitive world of like you know of and so you're sort of saying you've got to now rethink it. So it may not. Be, I mean, maybe one strategy might be to kind of like like if there's enough people in that world that are that can influence that social world to kind of shift slightly. Such that you know it doesn't become so. Do you know what I'm getting at? I'm sorry, I'm not really quite. Yeah, I mean, like one uh, one it's path. That well. One path I can see is first coming at them with the pitchforks argument. You want to prevent the pitchforks, right. then how about this small basic yeah. income? Then once the small basic income is in place, not only will the pitchforks not happen, but they'll see all these other benefits to society, and that that also affect them. And then it might start becoming more apparent that higher basic income would have even more of this effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then then uh, then I think they will. I think that could convince a lot of maybe people in this world. But then there's going to be always. I think there's always going to be a fraction that just. You know, and it's an open question. I don't know how many people are really sort of so Machiavellian that they <laughs> they just care, the only thing they care about is being you know kind of like having power or how we define it above other people and not really it's an that's an open question about human nature which I can't answer but well here's my argument uh, it, Matt yeah uh, if, if you give you more people more freedom then uh, when you have all your power you actually are able to show that you earned it and there's the whole like Elysium argument where they don't care about the people on earth that you can just go into their um, gay go, go, gay the the movie with Matt Damon? I don't know who the actors are. I don't pay attention to the actors. Okay, all right. <laughs> the the one that's the space station in space, and they're trying to get there, and uh, that, that, that's that the one that uh, yes. talking about. They, they just want to um, they be in their gay communities, and they have all their guards protecting them, and yeah. and so they don't care about anyone else. That's probably more expensive than a basic income to pay for all those cards. Yeah. I don't know. But I mean, I guess we also had an article a while ago about like, 
I don't know, the different possible futures, and one of them is that right. the rich people just want to keep killing off more other people so they can take all the resources for themselves, or, you know, there's like various things. Yeah. The thing is, I don't think there's a point at which that reaches equilibrium. No, you kill off all the poor people. Just and one now, dude left by the end. You're right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it, you know, 2,000 women or something. 2,000. <laughs> 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 oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But, but I think, to Alex, to your point, it's like, I don't know if it would seem to them, like, I like your point about what people are just used to, like, it wouldn't necessarily seem to them Machiavellian, it would just seem to them, like, this right. is the quality of life that I need to be happy, and everyone really, like, clings to that, whatever level it is. Yeah. Um, you know, we cling to a quality of life that's much greater than a lot of people around the world, but it would still be, like, really hard for us to give that up, even though we're aware, aware of that difference, you know, and, and yeah. I imagine the wealthy, you know, wealthier than, than where I'm at, that's the same idea, like, they just take it for granted, and... It doesn't yeah. seem evil, it just seems like this is what no, I'm No, 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 I'm not saying that, yeah, I'm, I wasn't saying that the people, <laughs> most most people are probably not in, uh, like in that right. category. I just was sort of, just going back to the articles, it's just mm, kind of like yeah. interesting the way they sort of like break down that, the, the sort of like, um, like it doesn't necessarily need to be a sort of, I always think of it, you know, like people when they talk about the power league, they think of like smoky rooms with cigars, <laughs> you know, like right. X-Files or something. Yeah, it, doesn't yeah. ha it doesn't have to be like that, it can be a lot more loose and yeah. yet it still produces the same effect yeah so i feel like that's how, how do you i don't know i don't have an answer for this but just yeah. make, it makes me wonder how you can you sort of like can shift that consciousness a little bit and maybe you won't have that yeah. push as much pushback from from that group yeah it's a great question um sometimes like the next generation is more open, like each next generation is sometimes more open to like throwing off the mores of their parents at least at a certain point so there could be like some of that too but um, I don't know. Yeah. Harry, Negan. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, just like so, an extreme recent yeah, example. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're just going to throw out the title now. Yeah, right. Well, it's, it's interesting, interesting how these dynamics kind of emerge organically just from, mm. you know, the way the economy works and, and maybe like accidents of history, you know, yeah. the way the political parties happen to be organized when there were wars, you know, like mm -hmm. this article talks about slavery and you know, how that lasted longer here and had an impact on versus politics and stuff and, like that. Yeah. yeah, versus other European countries. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah that is interesting. Yeah. yeah. You guys ready for the next quote? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Get this with it. In every society, there are experiences... Let me actually make this bigger. Is that... No? No? Let me just make the box smaller. That's good. In, in every society, there are experiences and material objects that are highly valued. If it is assumed that everyone in the society would like to have as great a share as possible of these experiences and objects, then the distribution of values in that society can be utilized as a power indicator. Those who benefit the most, by inference, are powerful. In American society, wealth and well-being are highly valued. People seek to own property, earn high incomes, to have interesting and safe jobs, and to live long and healthy lives. All of these values are unequally distributed, and all may be utilized as power indicators. So what he's talking about here is he's talking about how do you suss out how powerful a group of people is? Uh, and you can kind of uh, reverse engineer it. You can work backwards and say, like, well, if these people have more of the things that people generally want, then maybe you can infer that they have some kind of power and that's how they got those things. Yeah. And that's how they're able to maintain uh, that status. That makes yeah. sense. I guess if he's thinking about it as like, well, I'm trying to think of exceptions because I always do. I think this generally makes sense. Yeah. There might be certain like, so, like you could imagine a subculture that doesn't have a lot of power over like other groups, but manages to have like some good practices such that they live a long time, like they never smoke or they never drink or like, you know, maybe like a religious sect. But in general, I think I'm, I'm on board with him. Yeah, so, so this yeah. is interesting because, you know, initially when he defined power, he talked about, you know, influence over others. Right. Whereas these things might, you know, you know, the power itself, the influence over others might be a zero-sum thing, but people having all of the, the things that you would want for prosperity in a society might not be a zero-sum thing. You don't yeah, care, right? but um, I think I'm with him in the sense that he's saying there's always going to be some level of scarcity so if you see like some people having a lot more than other people, those right. people probably, he assumed, exerted influence in some way, at least as a group on average, to get that stuff more than other people? So, Isn't that kind of his argument? So is this, yeah. and I, I, 
if I remember correctly, this is so uh, this TSA three indicators is basically the first one, right? Right. So who, who benefits? Who benefits? The second one is the who governs, which is the next mm -hmm. paragraph. Yeah. And the who wins. So right. this is sort of like. So he's not saying this is necessarily like the only. This is like. Mm. This is just like one indicator that you can use amongst right. like a couple yeah, to sort of say like, oh, you know, like it's like, you know, like any one group might might have more more of this stuff, but then they don't govern that much. Like, you know, thinking like, you know, nouveau riche, you know, kind of like they don't, you know, they may have, you know, lifestyles of rich and fatuous or something like yeah. that. You know, like they're they're famous, they have a lot of money, they don't really govern it. I think. Like, you know, like Hollywood sort of comes to mind a little bit that way. Yeah. You know, where, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, whereas like uh, governs is a you know is a different group of people that have that yeah. power. Yeah. Uh, so there's a, there's a couple of <laughs> interesting things uh, in this paragraph. Uh, one is that you know he's he's enumerating the kinds of things that people generally want in our society. If we had a basic income, uh, people might not be uh, so intent on having jobs. You know, if they have a job, they probably want it to be uh, interesting and safe. Um, and they also, you know, you know, it's talking about earning high incomes. So that's again associated uh, with the labor market. And I think, you know, people generally want a lot of money. And you know, if you have, but they also kind of want, uh, you know just money in general. So if there's a basic income at a high enough level, um, you know, some people might want to figure out ways to go out and earn more, but it's, it's maybe especially culturally, especially with the jobs thing, um, that may be less of the, of the kind of thing that people are going after in our society. Yeah, I think that's right, but that seems like more of just like a, a nuance to the general point, which is he's just saying, take the things that are scarce that people want, who yes. has more of them. And you're right that like that could change a little right. bit in terms of which yeah. of those things, which what those things are. Because I mean I guess there's two effects there too as well. Like there's the if you don't need as a high you know high income by I mean if you want to get a, an income at least and maybe a high one, at least if, you, if there's not as much need to get it through jobs, then that benefits sort of your the basic income argument and the other the other thing is that part I feel like part of the reason high incomes are important is um or like people feel important is because uh people feel like they're buying security and accumulating yeah. stuff to, to prevent them from say sliding down the ladder. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, and if they know that if you know I, I kind of this this is kind of the feeling I have when I have this discussion with people and that I can never really it's hard to kind of explain it really clearly, but it's like if, if if you know that you know like that if you even if you like you wouldn't have as, there's not as much of a need to have that job to have that high income because even if you didn't you know you don't have that far to fall mm. yeah you know and I think that's sort of like that that's 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 like a second order effect of mm -hmm. of having a basic income that I think most people generally when you first talk about it, don't think about it. Yeah, that's good. And, and, and uh, kind of related to that is being able to retire. Uh, so yeah. people save for retirement so they can have a steady income during those years. Right, right, yeah. Right, right, yeah. If you're not worried about what's going to happen to you in retirement, uh, then that's going to change your behavior. That's yeah. going to change. Uh, and you guys did a whole, I missed the, uh, you did a whole, we did one of the yeah. I wanted to see that one. I watched yeah. it. Yeah. 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 But I, oh, go ahead. So I was just saying that, like, I feel like that's a big, you know, like, you know, whenever you have these debates about, you know, like, uh, you know, a lot of this about like pension funds and, you know, like, how are you going to basically um, do that? Yeah. You know, how are you going to, you know, and it's always, almost, always, always around jobs. Right, 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 right. Yep. Um, I just want to say, though, like, in terms of this point, I think yeah. all you'd have to do is replace it with, like, uh, they can spend their time in enjoyable ways. They have access to resources now and in the future in terms of like having money. And maybe I would add like dating opportunities. So, and like that would be like a pretty good list for like all across the world. People value those things. They're somewhat scarce, like not always equally scarce. And so like, if, that's just how I would kind of like reframe it in a more general way. And then I think it would pretty much apply. Yeah. Yeah. And I might throw in there like uh, freedom to spend your time how you want to spend it. That's kind of what I not, was going to say. Oh, with enjoyable ways to spend your time. Uh, more so enjoyable, yes, but also you get to freely kind of decide yeah. at any moment. Um, That's right. And then um, being less beholden to other people's power. 
Mm. Right? Yeah, like freedom to do what you want, not be coerced by the yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, so, so, you know, concretely that might mean, you know, everyone else is less powerful because they can't, you know, get you to do things, yeah, um, but they might not, you know, it depends, do they need to get you to do things? Is that something they're going to notice or care about, that kind of thing, especially if they have their relative wealth status and that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's interesting because, like, what people notice or care about kind of depends on their expectations, which I think speaks to your point, Alex, about, like, the path dependence of how you get to, like, a certain situation where people have certain expectations. So like Genghis yeah, Khan like socialization process. Yeah, like Genghis yeah. Khan is not gonna feel happy if he can't rape as many people as he wants. I mean like really like that's what he expects to be able to do. And like I say that because you know there's there are cases in our society that aren't extremely like Genghis Khan, but there are like people who have that kind of expectation almost. Or, like uh, and or they expect to be able to buy, you know, buy politi- political influence. And most of us aren't going around like sad that we can't buy political influence because we don't even think to have that kind of power. I but, believe there was a legal yeah. case that was just resolved. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thing, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so my point is like it's a bit endogenous to what people can have. Like the power yeah. that they can have is the power that they expect and, and then don't want to lose a lot of the time. Like, right. Want to. So then I guess the, the question is uh, how much of, of powerful people's power is just, you know, People not really thinking about it and being, you know, happy in their lives and wanting security and that kind of thing. Right. How much of it is like this Machiavellian stuff? How much of it is, is it like this getting away with stuff that would be impossible for everyone to get away with? You know. Yeah. Like how yeah. much of it is like um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Scalable. Right. Like how much like basically versus zero sum like you were talking about. You know, I think there's those two different categories. Right. right. You know, like the affluenza kid. Yeah. Um, he like. Um, I had a car crash, and he, and his, his argument was like his parents didn't set any boundaries for him, so he got away with it. Wow, yeah, that's interesting. Oh, that and was then, defense. Uh, and then, uh, his defense like, was that he was able to pay a lawyer a lot of money. Uh, and then, this, <laughs> and then, um, he got, he was um, on, what was it? He was on. Um, what is it called? Probation. Uh, probation. Parole. And uh, probation. And then he, well, didn't contact his uh, his probation officer or something like that. So he got in trouble. And I don't know what happened to him after that. Hmm. Yeah. Nobody does. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. uh, so Eddie's on the live stream. Oh, uh, he nice. says, the finance community can also profit from markets going down mm, or interest rates point. going up. Pretty much any change can be profited from if yeah. it can be predicted. That's a good point, so, Eddie. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's always going to be true that, that whoever's betting on something happening uh, is going gonna, is gonna to profit when that, when that thing actually happens. Uh, but if you look at the aggregate, you know, like the, the aggregate finance community, um, if the markets are going down, uh, on average, they lose out. I think that's still going to be true. But there are, you know, just like in, in 2008, you know, they were shorting, going, shorting stock. Yeah. yeah. Um, if, you short, if you short the market, if the people who short, short the market are going to win. Um, but uh, in order for them to win, a lot of other people have to lose. So, so generally speaking, I think the, the finance community is going to have to... Um, you know, uh, adapt. adapt to to uh, a shrinking of, of the financial sector. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a quick question here because I because it comes back to when when you gave this you know when you gave the talk. Um, yeah. And I really like that idea of like yeah shrinking like like shrinking the financial sector is sort of almost as a byproduct of of the way this this um, you could get base income right yeah. essentially mm-hmm. or paper. I like that, and I feel like this kind of also kind of speaks to um, this this kind of idea because it's kind of like a way of doing it that doesn't it's not head on in the same way that you know when you know Bernie Sanders Elizabeth Warren goes after the, the you know they go direct it's kind of like you're not you're, cre- you're not creating a new tax you're not creating a new yeah. tax and I think like that could be a really powerful way to to sort of not sell it, but it has this indirect effect of like reducing the power of that sector just yeah. just by yeah. just by its nature. Yeah. And you know that 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 is kind of like that. And I wonder at what point there would be the pushback because there would be like, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, people, smart people in the financial sector will kind of realize it straight away, obviously. But it's sort of like as a way to market it. Yeah, um, I think that's I think that's a good point. I think a lot of um, a lot of rich people, a lot of wealthy people. 
um, are very averse to higher taxes because they don't want their money to be taken away. Right. If you can convince them that you do it without taxes, uh, then you know that could be that could be persuasive. Well, like I said, it could be kind of a Trojan horse thing because like then they lose all their money another way. <laughs> yeah. So, like the richest people don't pay tax. Like don't pay so many taxes on their yeah. um, how they're making their money. It's more like this financial sector stuff. Yeah, you could also make like uh, moral arguments, like uh, you know they they might be against government handouts because because then you know mm. the, they have to pay for it or something like that. But if you convince them that the reason the financial markets are so successful is because we're compensating and and trying to prop up uh, consumer spending in this really inefficient way, then essentially what they're getting is government handouts that are you know funded yeah. by the poor or something yeah. like that. No, I yeah. still agree with like you and Alex that it's like a better strategy politically. Like yeah. it might still create a lot of pushback, but it's different and so it doesn't like there aren't as many like prepared defenses right, ideologically. Like automatically, like, automatically yeah. like for because exactly. it doesn't fit yeah. like the standard ideology battle that you have. Um, and so that is a benefit in and of itself because mediating like the influence is often are often like these ideological arguments that because because part of it is like they're they're trying to form a coalition with people who don't have the same financial stake system right and so they need like the ideology to kind of like form that, that i think that's why yang's campaign was to, yeah. to that degree successful because it did kind of it kind of go went around that sort of mm -hmm. standard kind of ideological blindness yeah it wasn't talking i mean i know he did it was through vat so it was Still a tax, but it wasn't like a wealth tax or something yeah. like that. So, uh, so I feel like there's definitely something to be said for, um, and I feel like this. It's kind of like uh, I feel like all of these things. You, know, you can imagine like you can have, you know, like your mechanism for getting basically, and we have a bunch of other different mechanisms to get it, and they could, they could all sort of like essentially function the same way, but because they're sort of like they work slightly differently or frame slightly differently, they they come with different. Arguments. Arguments. And then, yeah, yeah, exactly. They come with different arguments, but they also come with different sort of, um, you know, sort of like ideological baggage, yeah. which is yeah. kind of like, you know, and I think that's, uh, this, I think that's the strength of the basic income thing is that it kind of like, it sort of gets around a lot of those yeah. sort of arguments, uh, at least, or at least it sort of circumvents them until such time as like, you know, the power elite or whoever decides they don't want it and they come up with some new one, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> No, but I feel like that that could be a long time coming. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's still some like the idea that people are going to be lazy or they're going to like do drugs all day or like that. You know, there's still some idea oh, yeah, 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 yeah. to bring yeah. to bear against it, but it, it doesn't have come of the same yeah. level, so it's, that's good. It's building up its uh, yeah ideological opponents. Yeah, yeah you gotta like yeah. get in there fast. Well, I think it's <laughs> sort of these sort of things, almost like the immune system. You know, yeah, you exactly. sort of have these like you know like and there's no T cells to recognize mm -hmm. this sort of like you know totally you know, yeah. yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. So the idea is we need to infect society while we still can. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's <laughs> not use those With this infection thing yeah. uh, to <laughs> right now considering what's going on yeah. in the world. Okay. I want to By the way, it's not about uh, not talking about real biology. No, no. <laughs> um I also wanted to point out like this point about power, which is like, you know, the sort of philosopher's perspective of like if you could design an, a society I don't like everything about Rawls, but he kinda of tries to do this like if you could design a society, like how much inequality of power and other things would you want to have? And you know, he sort of talks about the general idea of wanting that to be aligned with the public good. And uh, why I'm thinking of this is like part of the problem that Alex points out with the financial sector is like it's at the point where a lot of it is just not really like helping the public good is not really like real investments that are like doing anything in the world, that kind of thing. So so shrinking it in that way. Things around not creating actual products. Yeah, so. exactly. I mean I'm not an expert, but that's kind of what you talk about makes some sense. And and so Alex also talks about aligning to the degree that people are making more money, either through making products or making investments, aligning that with the public good more. Um, and giving people money also to spend, like aligns the profit motive with the public good more. Yes. The point that you make a lot, which I think is, is important because while there are costs to some people having more power than others, at least in that case, there's also this like social benefit to people having more power, which is ideally kind of quote unquote how it's supposed to work, or right. why anybody thinks like you know capitalism or market study can be good for the public good, right? Because it's supposed to align those things. Right. In, in a yeah. world where the people have the money, the way to get rich is to do things that benefit the people. Right. So so I think that's an interesting angle in power too. Is like how much are, is the are the power differences kind of like meta level for the public good or not right. and how could a basic income kind of shift that 
so that they were right. more for the public good. Right. Obviously, you you want to provide incentives for. Uh, people in the society and the economy to to do things, do productive things that, that benefit people yeah. and you know that kind of thing. Um, so right now there are a lot of incentives that people have that maybe aren't aren't aligned with that. Yeah. 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 So. Yep. And said so the those incentives are to benefit the wealthy, like creating um, like country resorts and thing and like expensive cars and. Yeah, if you want to profit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how many like how, how many like how many stories I've heard read in the last couple of years about like the number of yachts that the average number of yachts that the super wealthy own now compared to yeah, like Betsy uh, Veros or whatever it is, and she has ten yachts. The Betsy DeVos. DeVos, that's yeah. it. Betsy that's DeVos right. has ten yachts. Uh -huh. yes. What do you do with ten yachts? <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> You tie them all together and make a mega yacht. So when you crash one, you know, because you, you, you just crash them into each other out of the light. You know, you, I mean, yeah. I, I, there's too probably choice that an answer to that question. Maybe you, like, roll them out to people. They might be in different places. Like, oh, in different right. Places. right. So you can yeah. show up and have your yacht already yeah. there. Yeah. 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 She has a few in the Great Lakes, I think. Yeah, you don't want to transport your yacht. To, yeah, you can't even get it from the Great Lakes to the Pacific. Like the Wolf the Wolf and Wall Street. How does right? anybody yeah. not have twenty yachts? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How does anyone believe that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you show up. Um, there's no yacht. You have so that's right. Yacht. You're gonna if, if you want to make money, you're gonna have to uh, go to where the money is. So yeah, if that's rich yeah. people, yeah, exactly. and the way to make money is to build yachts for rich people. You're gonna do that. If it's the financial sector, and the way to make money is uh, just to invest in financial derivatives, uh, yeah. then you're going to do that, right? Right. right, right. Um, and these things are not a lot. There, you're you're putting a lot of work in that's not going toward uh, uh, benefiting. Well, society. it's benefiting Betsy DeVos, who now has convenient yachts in many locations. And I bring this up only to your point. Like, there are some losers if you're like moving more of the market towards like the average person or if that. Kind of uh, yes, there are those yachts, you know. She does want those yachts. Um, there's, but there's no like sort of um, kind of a law of nature that says that the financial sector has to exist in the way that it exists. Right, right. No. Right. no like no. it's not like, yeah. I mean, that's, I think like that's sort of like the, you know, when you sort of the argument that people say, well, you know, you're interfering with the free market, you know, when you're reducing the financial sector and that's not really... Yeah. Free market anyway. Totally. I it's mean, not I think, in the usual I say you're interfering with the free market when you're reducing the basic income. Yeah. That's yeah. another, yeah, that's another <laughs> way to think yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah, I love um, Alex's angle on this. I mean, I'm sure you're going to talk about it as all you say, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, I think you're right that the financial sector d doesn't have to be this way. And not only that, but even when you, when people are, you know, excited about the financial sector, they know about the financial sector, they generally have this this idea that the ideal financial sector, what's it, what it's really doing is facilitating uh, right. in investment in like real, in real, businesses. real businesses, real production, right. that kind right. of thing. Uh, and if you, if you fund consumer spending using the basic income, that allows us to transform the financial sector into something that actually does look like that. Right, as opposed yeah. to a predatory thing that it does now, right? Well, predatory is a judgmental okay. word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as opposed to, yeah, just, just kind of money, making money on itself. That, that, yeah. that I think of that as yeah. predatory, but I guess it's yeah. a value judgment. I, I, I yeah. pe that. People are responding to incentives. Yeah. It's not and their it, fault. Another problem with it is like the boom <laughs> yeah. bust thing that Alex talks about right. a lot. Like it's unstable, so it kind of like collapses. And that's true. And then that true, takes yeah. a lot of people and down that's, with it. Yeah, and I think like, well, I mean, I don't know if, you guys have seen this documentary called Push about the um, housing market and they make a big point there about the financial sector's role in in like going and buying up huge chunks of like start like for example an example like in Sweden like huge chunks of low income properties mm -hmm. and then package that in this kind of collateral debt obligation and right. it's similar to CDOs and all that stuff and then doing that and then what you end up having is these all these empty empty places yeah. because they're actually easier to play with when they're empty. And not uh, actually someone living there. Oh, that's sure. interesting. You don't have to take anyone out. You don't have to take anyone out. And you can have this, all this. this oh, all these, so they're like tokens now, but they're actually valuable resources. They're valuable. Yeah. So, yeah, so to your that's point about the, the sort of the idea that, you know, um, um, you know, uh, that, you know, like the ideal investor in housing obviously wants to make a profit, right, to, to rent people out. Well, that still exists, but then there's this other whole thing where it's like now it's actually 
quite profitable for you know huge chunks of like London and New York and Barcelona to be actually not occupied and then they can use that to play with and that's the same kind of it's a similar dynamics to what you get in the more traditional financial sector, I think. Yeah, yeah. well, that's pretty pretty wasteful. Yeah, it's yeah. incredibly wasteful, right? <laughs> yeah. I feel like uh, we can use money for that purpose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. No, it's, a, it's worth seeing. I, it's uh, it's a good yeah. 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 What well, is it on? It's unfortunately it's not actually available in. Uh, I think they've had it in film festivals. I think it'd be released here, but I was I was um, um, I was able to see it uh, when I when I was in New Zealand. Oh, okay. interesting. Cool. I'm sure we can track it down somehow. Uh, virtually um, speaking. It can be hard to hard to find some of those ones. Like, I haven't found oh, uh, really? Planet of the Humans. That's oh, the uh, the documentary about uh, uh, why our uh, anti-climate change uh, measures aren't working and stuff like that. Oh, wait, that. we haven't found the, the Michael Moore one? It's oh, not Michael Moore, Moore uh, oh, it's not. but he's consulting on it. It's the, the same oh. one you're thinking of. But yeah, I haven't found it. You haven't been able to find it? No. Is it out? Is it not out? Well, it's not out. It was at, at festivals. Oh, uh, you know, but is it coming out? Because I don't see it. I mean, We can't find but... it even in the darkest corners of the We'll, we'll keep looking. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can get you guys a copy of that would, the, anyway, that uh, would be of really interesting. It's really, really, really yeah. interesting. It yeah. speaks a lot of what we talk about. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. You guys ready for the next book? Yeah, yeah well, I think we've got, a, we've got a little thing from Eddie, just oh, cool. want to mention that. Eddie says, wealthy definitely lose out in aggregate. Most wealthy are not in finance. Yes, you point to you. Happy yeah. face. We've been talking a lot about uh, finance, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I think, you know, people lose out in some capacity. So there's some, some types of businesses that won't be profitable anymore, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's some financial assets that will lose their value, that kind of thing. Um, but I think it's a little more complicated to conclude that um, that people will necessarily lose out in total because they have this, you know, security. The entire society has the security, and and um, you know they, you know, their relative status might might very well be intact. There are still ways to get rich. They have a lot more freedom, a lot less, um, a lot less uh, risk of falling into destitution. You know, like that kind of stuff. So. So yeah, I mean, like uh, financially, there's going to be people who lose out, but that's not the only dimension. Yeah. yeah. I, w I wonder if you could. There's this famous quote. I wish I could remember who said it. They said, you know, like I, I like I like taxes with it. I buy civilization. So you could maybe repurpose that mm. quote, saying I that's like basic one. income because with it I purchase civilization. That's really cool. Uh, or like something that. along those lines. I forget who said it, but yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Um, that's, right. I'll give that's, that's just one thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm with Alex too that sometimes what people want is just to be the richest or like wherever position they are. So, like, in that sense, that can stay intact to some yeah. degree. Kind of depends on whether Betsy really wants those yachts or like. <laughs> it's okay with three yachts. Or it's maybe more just... that she just wants more yachts. Like, how much of her value or happiness is coming out of having more yachts than the next guy right. versus having actual like yachts in every Right. Well, and or you can be Bill Gates with the largest job, six hundred and fifty yeah. mil million dollars. So uh, Eddie says, uh, very beneficial to society for smart people to get into the real economy instead of financial. And I think that's right. And you know, there might even be things we can do to make the transition a little bit smoother for uh, the people who are kind of locked into the financial sector right now. Um, and that might be something worth exploring. Like, hey. A lot of your assets are going to lose value, where but the government is going to provide you some, you know, insurance on that, or we're going to yeah. do things gradually. You know, the government will backstop markets for certain things for a little yeah. while. You know, kind of like ease the transition. Right. But yeah. ultimately, you can still get to this point where if they want to keep getting richer or stay rich, uh, they're going to have to start doing things that that are actually yeah. beneficial to society. Uh, or they can do like. Um Pay back like with the slave with, with England and the slaves and what was it, um, Jamaica or something, and they they paid them back slowly. Um, the ben the how much it costs to free them, and they oh, just right. and they just like three years ago they finally paid it all off. Really? Uh -huh. Yeah, com compensating the slave owners for the loss the loss of property. Was something that oh, happened really? and that, that was in the, in, the in England, the UK, Jamaica, Jamaica. Jamaica. Jamaica I well, think they were owned by England, right? right yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that's something that's happened at other times and places as well. And it's 
you know, like if you want to free the slaves, then saying, hey, we'll we'll pay you right. to free the slaves. That's that you know. That'll help. That'll yeah. Help. Maybe I mean we weren't really offering that, and we're, maybe we were offering that in the U.S. too. Um, just didn't point over. Hmm. I think we got to not offer that by having a civil war instead. Yeah, mm -hmm. but England did it before we did. Have right, a civil right. War right. Too, so. Yeah, you get to murky moral territory there, though, when you start paying back the people, because then it's like it kind of legit post. It could it could be seen as being legitimizing that right first yeah. place. So I, it's it's I a think, question of like practicality versus yeah. I guess but versus moral like yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I think it is murky moral territory. But if the alternative is that you don't get to free the slaves and than the main kind of on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and I think it's similar similar here. Like, you know, if we're putting resources into, uh, you know, protecting people's wealth as the financial sector goes through this transition, then those are resources that are potentially not going to other people as well. Right. But it might help uh, uh, allow the transition to happen at all. Right. Yeah. Kind of to your point about how yeah. to like deal with this and, and not get too much pushback and yeah, like, have yeah. a smoother. I mean, a smooth transition is, I think, quite valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also true that you know, like, if everything gets disrupted suddenly, if there's a sudden shock, that doesn't you know that doesn't only affect rich people. And yeah. It certainly, if, if everyone else is getting a basic income, then you know they're they're protected a little bit, but it's still probably. Yeah. Uh, good for everyone That's not right. have sudden disruption. We've talked about how yeah. there's lots of like middle class people or other people who are like planning on certain things and like you know huge disruptions in the financial markets could be bad for them too. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Okay, look. So let's. We can just shrink the chat box. Uh, no, I can't do that. So the so I'm just gonna explain. So uh, if I change the size of the text window. Uh, then that changes the size that it appears on the live stream. So I have to keep it exactly that same size. Oh, exactly. Right. Uh, so it has to be. We want it to be staying in the corner there at it's exactly not like that over size. Your head. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, so uh, here's the quote: uh, Power can also be can power also can be inferred from studies of who occupies important institutional positions and takes part in important decision making groups. If a group or class is highly overrepresented in relation to its proportion of the population, it can be inferred that the group is powerful. If, for example, a group makes up 10% of the population but has 50% of the seats in the main governing institutions, then it has five times more people in governing positions than would be expected by chance. And there is thus reason to believe that the group is a powerful one. Pretty straightforward. It comes, Seems yeah. reasonable to me. Yeah. Uh, I guess the only nuance I would add, but I generally like this, is like there's this question of like how do you define a group, and is there like a coalition? So, so for right. example, like I'll try to use a concrete example that I'm not a, like an expert on, so I won't really make a claim one way or the other. But like you could say like oh like like are white people a group in the U.S. and like white people have more seats in Congress for sure, right? Like around mm -hmm. the population. But but do you want to call that the group or just like people born into a certain amount of wealth? Because it could be that a huge number of white people are never going to be in Congress, and then if they're not, is, is that groups are the people who are still looking out for them above other people? You know, so there's like these questions of how you define the group yeah. that I think are important, and is the group really a coalition that looks out for each other or not is also relevant. Uh, they could yeah. be the argument of like Republicans. They they um they argue against the state taxes and things like that because they think that someday they're going to be wealthy, even though they're probably not going to be wealthy. Mm, yeah, right, so like misperception of, um, of what you want. But I guess I'm just saying like group, yeah, like he's kind of maybe assuming that like, in my example, for example, like all white people favor other white people over other groups. But if that's not the right group boundary to draw, or it's uh, not really a coalition like that. So I don't think he's yeah. assuming that. The thing is, that yeah. this is a definition of applied to any group you choose, right? I think right. that's right. Yeah, I, I basically agree with this. I guess I was just trying to think yeah. what would be a nuance to it, and it's this question of like, how do you think about the group? Like, yeah. what's the right group? You don't you have, have to, to arbitrarily come up with nuances. We've got plenty of quotes. No, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I can I see think, a lot of tabs up there. I don't know why. I think I think when I see definitions for some reason, it prompts me to want to think of a different qualification. But I think these are totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You've been writing a paper recently. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty you ready much for the time. next one? Yeah. All right. I'll try to restrain myself here. There are many policy issues over which groups or classes disagree, 
In the United States, different policies are suggested by opposing groups in such issue areas as foreign policy, taxation, welfare, and the environment. Power can be inferred from these issue conflicts by determining who successfully initiates, modifies, or vetoes policy alternatives. So this is the who wins thing. If there's, if, there's, if there's a debate about what should be done in terms of deciding policy, uh, which groups tend to, tend to win the debate? Yeah. Like in the 1995 um, welfare reform, of how the, they, they got rid of most cash benefits and instead they had like work fair. Or like if young people tend to disagree with older people, and then like who wins that? You could divide it all sorts of ways. Like with a uh, with social security, um, taking up more and more of the well government pie. <laughs> all sorts of different issues. I like that he has these different criteria, like you were saying, Alex. It's kind of like yeah, this is like the third one of the three. Yeah. 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 Actually, this one is interesting because I was it reminded me. Of this paper that you, maybe you guys have already read or have heard about. It's, um, it's from 2014, called Testing Theories of American Politics, Elite Interest Groups and Average Citizens. And we maybe we want to do this at some point, but... Um, yeah, I haven't seen that. Uh, oh, yeah. They do have this really nice, interesting um, uh, sort of like, you know, graphs where you look at like average citizens' preferences and then like the elite's preferences mm. and the interest group and then yeah. kind of like compare that. So... Mm -hmm. Um, That's really interesting. Is I've heard batted around the statistic, like, it, you know, in the, if seventy percent of the population prefers something and it still doesn't pass or something. I don't know where that comes from. I don't know if it comes from that paper. Maybe, but, maybe. Um, it got so, a lot of traction. I think, yeah, when it came out, that's but. really interesting. But this idea is like, is the majority kind of does the majority have a decent amount of power? Right. And the, the point is like, if, the, if a high majority favors something, it doesn't happen. That's kind of to this point. They're like right. losing. Right. They, they don't really have that much power. I think um, gun control is a big. That's one of example yeah. of this. Yeah. So. Gun, and and um, I think the right to choose is less extreme, but like also has but a pretty good majority, and yet yeah. is still kind of being contested. Uh, and then but there's yeah, se control. and then there's seventy five percent of the people want to uh, um, Trump out of office, but that didn't happen. Yeah, I don't know that statistic, but that would make sense. Yeah, yeah, another good example. That was during the impeachment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have. A, so this is kind of basically got a lot of good data that basically kind of, kind of addresses yeah, this question, which is kind of crazy. that's very cool. And they, you know, and they define it very like you know, average citizen, economic elites, interest groups, and sort of like yeah. essentially, you know, they can quantify it through going through like. I think like congressional, you know, what congressional votes and stuff like that. Yeah. So anyway. it'd be interesting to do that, like for people for for a group you wouldn't think of right away, like people in even like poorer people, but in like swing states or something like that. Yeah. Like their issues versus other people's issues. So they yeah. Have in those yeah. Kinds of debates yeah. too, because yeah. of how the political process is. Right. Right. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Cool. No, that's really interesting. Tangent, yeah. tangent but I yeah. just thought. No, it's quite hmm. quite relevant actually. Yeah. 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 So. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question also, um, if we had something like a basic income, how many of these um, policies, policy issues would remain? Uh, would there be, you know, arguments or as many arguments about taxation or welfare? Um, you know, would there be this tension between, oh, do you care about the environment or do you care about the economy? Would there be, um, you know, would people be, you know, saying why are we you know um, helping other countries when you know there are Americans who need our support you know that kind of thing so we can look at each of the example issue areas that he listed and you can think about how how basic income uh, could affect all of them well, like Martin Luther King saying we well, can spend 20 billion dollars on an unfair war why can't we and, uh, and on um, Sending a man to the moon. Why can't we spend it on our people and with basic of uh, basic income? Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, you know, like if we don't have poverty anymore and our society is generally prosperous, you know, maybe people are really excited about you know projects that send people to Mars and, and stuff like that. It's like not no longer you know you're doing the sense that you're doing that instead of doing what you actually should be doing or something. I think that's right. I mean, yeah. I think it would help. I also think there's always going to be issues that people disagree on. Oh, sure. Um, and I was, I think another interesting thing about basic income related to this is like, you were talking about how do you think about 
power distribution with a basic income. Mm -hmm. And so you could look not just at like how income is distributed, but also these, I like these, this idea of looking at like who's winning these debates. Because it could be that even if it doesn't change the income distribution, it would, cha it would change like the balance of who's winning the debates. Or if it didn't, then you might be, con I might be concerned there's like still a, a, a big problem in terms of political influence. So I find that yeah. kind of interesting as a metric. Like I, kind of like I, think, I think I would be concerned. I, think I would expect that the basic income would give a lot more people a voice. Yeah, and, I would expect yeah. that too. We had one on, uh, we had a discussion on civic engagement. Yeah. You know, yeah. like if people have the freedom to spend their time how they choose, they have the freedom to participate in the political process. Mm -hmm. to, to even, they have the freedom to even, you know, sit down and think about how they want things to work, that kind of thing. Not like the soror sorority of Yang in um, in uh, Iowa, where there all these people, you know, these women were um, volunteered their time, and, and they lived in this house and um, like canvassing for Yang and, <laughs> and all around is I think it was Davenport. Yeah, you know, you, you could have, a lot more people would have the freedom to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, I just like it as a metric though too, because you could try to see like. How, how things are shifting, you know, if, more, if a big majority of people support something, does it pass more often? Like, right. how, how are these debates tipping now with basic income? It's another piece of information yeah. besides just, like, who has more money or whatever, which starts to speak to whether that money is actually being used for too much political influence or not. Or Yeah, I like it. Anyway, that's yeah. And I think Eddie, Eddie has something. Yeah, yeah, so Eddie was commenting on the uh, what we were saying before. He said, you could also say that... Um, they just give back the artificial subsidy of extreme monetary policy. Well, you would say that, I think. I, I would say that. that. <laughs> I do say that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just an interesting framing. I like that framing, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Ready for the next one? Yeah, let's yeah. do it. I like these. Who has predominant power in the United States? The short answer from 1776 to present is those who have the money, or more specifically, who own income producing land and businesses have the power. So this is interesting because uh, under basic income, those who have the money changes, uh, but it's no longer necessarily people who own income producing land and businesses, it's people who are citizens of an income producing country, right? Uh, and, and that's kind of uh, the, same, the same thing. It's just, it, you know, like people having access to, 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 the, to the income, to the money. Um, and yeah. So. And the money would allow them to vote on which products they want to buy instead of the people who have the money vote using the uh, oversized power of that money to influence politics. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the people with the money always are the ones who get to, to vote uh, on what gets produced. Uh, and if everyone has the money, then, then, then more people get a say in that. Um, I think, yeah, I think, I, I think what it does is it gives people, it gives everybody more of a say, or, or you know, the, the less powerful people more of a say in what the market does for them, but it also gives them more of a say in, in what the government does for them. So it's both, yeah. I think um, this is, this is, Good, but I guess what it doesn't capture, because it's just one sentence or two, is like the degree to which this is true, which obviously must have changed from 7076 to now at different time points. Mm -hmm. And also, like, this is kind of true a lot of the time, or at least since we had more of like a market based economy, but, or even before that, but, but like the degree matters too, right? Like the Catholic Church had more power, I think, in the Middle Ages than. Not in the US. In, the, in Europe, in, in the Europe, Middle Ages. Yeah, right. Then so, this, then, then like, well, we, we were here. I mean, there's Well, he's drawing a contrast between you know the U.S. since it was founded and and power structures that have occurred in other parts of the world. Oh, he's going to a different kind of contrast. Yeah, okay. that's, that's the I'm, idea. That's all. Uh, so he's emphasizing that the the power structures in the United States have been dominated by economic power. Right. Yeah. Uh, the next paragraph or two covers that. I gotcha. Yeah. Okay, I'm just getting ahead of myself. Then. Yeah. Yeah. But we're not going to read those paragraphs. Oh. Well, then I guess I'll, I'll just say, like, there's who, but then there's also to what degree do they have more right. power than the rest, which is another important factor. Because yeah. to some extent, this might always be somewhat true, but then, like, how big is that difference makes a difference to it. Yeah. And I don't think that this is necessarily uh, 
a problem either that the people with money have the power. It's a problem that the uh, money isn't getting to everyone, is what I would say. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I guess this is related. So, the only power network of any consequence in the history of the United States has been the economic one, which, under capitalism, generates a business owning class and a working class, along with small businesses and skilled craft workers who are self-employed, and a relatively small number of highly trained professionals, such as architects, lawyers, physicians, and scientists. In this context, the key reason why money can rule, i.e., why the business owners who hire workers can rule, is that the people who work in the factories and fields were divided from the outset into free and slave, white and black, and later into numerous immigrant ethnic groups as well, making it difficult for workers as a whole to unite politically to battle for higher wages and better social benefits. Interesting. So this is where he's going to draw like a contrast to some of the other... He already drew the contrast up oh, there. Yeah, about yeah. that oh, where he talks about it. No big church, like yeah. you brought up the Catholic church. No, yeah. no big government um, as it took to survive in Europe. Uh, no big military until... After 1940, you know, that kind of thing. Yep, like the military in Thailand, they overthrow the government periodically. Yeah. Fun I guess I could too. imagine worse things than money, like, if in terms of what could have, have power. I can imagine yeah. a lot of worse ones that have happened in history, like the military. Yeah. Like, um, like the church, in some cases, too. Um, in part because, as you point out, like, it's a little bit easy, it's a little bit more diffuse already, this, like, idea of whoever has the money. It's less of a cabal, although it depends on the time period. But also, like, it's easier to spread around. Like, it's easier to give more people money than to, like, make them high up in the Catholic Church or part of the military or, like, part of an elite noble class that's delineated by blood from everybody else or right. a lot of the other things. That it's are really also different. probably true that the, the, the system we have now is quite different to, you know, essentially it was a well, pre-industrial yeah, you know, it's revolution, hard to and so right. you didn't have the... The economies of scale that generated quite the same, at least initially, at least in that, yeah. the, the first year you know, that, that you had now. So, like you know, Eli yeah. Whitney and the cotton gin, and then the steam engine, and then. Yeah, as soon as that came in, things changed. But I, I know, like, I was, I think it was, was it Jefferson, Jefferson was, we used to talk about, like, this idea that basically everyone would be kind of essentially a sort of a craftsman or artisan small business owner the sort of the idea that you know that the United States was kind of like and that that is a distinction between because you know because that's what they didn't they didn't want to have those big structures like Europe they didn't want to have yeah. this kind of and it probably was like that initially and you know I mean obviously there was the slave part of course is <laughs> the wrinkle there but no. um, um, but then it became I'd say, I think like then once the industrial revolution came along and then all this other stuff that it made, it made that it made that economic power, uh, I feel like it becomes more problematic than it might have before. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, yeah. Yeah, just because of the concentration of, yeah. of uh, uh, productive, yeah. uh, productive power. Yeah, right. so even though you didn't have this sort of like the top down institutions that have been around for generations, always. And not initially. Yeah. You saw this other kind of thing that became it took their place essentially. Yeah. Um, I think the, the I agree with all of that and the flip side of that is that like voting rights used to be more limited, right? So like wasn't it only yeah. handed people? That's true. Yeah. Yeah, there was no golden age, like, right? Yeah. So like going back to like <laughs> so oh yeah, we yeah. could just go back uh, to like that perfect time that, in, in yeah, history. It's, it's like nineteen 19- 12 or something like that, the Senate was voted on by the legislature of the states. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's right, it wasn't a popular vote, it was mm-hmm. senators, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah it was good. more like the law, House of Lords in the UK, right. which is kind of like, it was in, is, I think still half appointed, oh, not, not, not uh, elected. Yeah. Yeah. They're all there, just, they're, 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 not even, they're all appointed, they're hereditary. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah, hereditary good. peers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one thing that think Blair did was get rid of like, Half of them. Oh, so they kept some. Yeah. But you like the others were now cut it down. Yeah. yeah, cut it down. But then you were still appointing them. You know, right. voting for them. Yeah, so. that's interesting. Huh. 
Sounds, Sounds like, like a step in the right direction, I guess. Maybe. Yeah. Or it's a yeah. step just for like the president or whoever to have more power. It I'm is. Pointing a bunch of people yeah. instead right. of them being hereditary. I'm not true. sure that's more more democratic. Actually, that could be less. I mean, I think I think in general, well, like when society, society moves in, you know, kind of when a society advances in the direction you would want, uh, it still has to be compatible with someone someone's power desires. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, uh, I think Eddie has some points. Yeah. So Eddie says, uh, "Civil war is an interesting case example about." dynamics of power in our democracy. Some have suggested freeing the slaves after the start of the Civil War was a tactical move to win the war. Um, I'm sure that it, it was not a ta at least partly a tactical move. Uh, and retain Union and Southern tax revenues. Lincoln definitely was more moderate about abolition uh, than the myth portrays him. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's right. That um, and it's easy to, um, you know, it's easy to free all the slaves in the southern states um, when they, yeah. they're not going to do what you want anyway, and you're already at war with them. Uh, yeah. And that Lincoln was, well, um, would, would rather preserve the Union and keep the slaves than fight the Civil War in the first place. Yeah, Lincoln, that's right. Yeah, no so the Civil War kind of almost forced his hand. Yeah. In that sense. Um, yeah. And also, I think, weren't they like enlisting the slaves that they freed as they were going through the South? Like things like that. I feel, I feel like there were other tactical surprised. reasons that I like, was pointing to. I forget the details. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, in, this, in this particular quote, um, you know, just the emphasis on everything being uh, oriented around labor and yeah. work, who's the producers, who's the consumers, yeah. you know, it's saying that uh, under capitalism, uh, the economic power structure uh, necessarily, or the economic power network necessarily generates a business owning class and a working class. Um, now, he's, he's imagining capitalism without a basic income. Um, I would say that if you call if you have a free market, um, you know, economy uh, with a basic income, you know, I'd probably still say that that can count as capitalism. But that's not what he's imagining. But if you do have that, uh, then a lot of this stuff doesn't doesn't just automatically happen the way he's describing. You're not necessarily going to divide people into a business owning class and a working class. I was that kind of thing. confused about like yeah. the importance of that distinction. Even the class even, or? like the particular just that decision to divide it by business owners and workers, because then also he talks about small business owners, which are technically also business owners. It just seems like a funny division because some workers might be making a lot of money. And then he kind of separates out the ones that are making more money by calling them professionals. Uh, like last week, yeah. in the, last week the un there was a union with. Uh, with um, both produ uh, called the producers, which had workers and the and the business owners in the same thing. Okay, I think it's a degree. It's a question of scale. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's like yes, you can have small businesses that aren't really like that are so small that you're they're essentially self-employed, right? Um, and you're not necessarily like hard. I mean, you may have small number, but you're not sort of like having this kind of like. I could call it yeah. the corporation essentially. Yeah. Right. But by and large, you know, the economy is divided into these two classes and then you have outliers. So basically, what do you say? Interesting. Yeah. But I mean, the business owners, then, if it's only the really big businesses, are kind of outliers too. Because I mean, that's a smaller group than professionals in number, I'm sure. Um, people who own companies like Coca Cola, that's like a tiny group of people. Whereas, like, there's tons of lawyers and. There's a ton of people who work for those companies. Though. Yeah, tons. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of these classes is, is smaller than the other. <laughs> smaller well, and more powerful. I yeah. guess the power is what makes yeah. it a specific class to focus on yeah. rather than the number of people in it because it's a pretty small number of people, right? I think the, yeah, I mean, the idea is that the economy is organized in this way. So even though it's a small number of people, it's, it's affecting, you know, everyone else is a worker. So every, most people are participating in the system. And most of them are on one side of the, of the line, whereas, you know, there are a few on the other. And then there's some people who are kind of outside of that. Yeah. And, you know, like, and there was a book I read uh, recently called, or maybe last year, called uh, Private Government, which is essentially arguing that a lot of Companies essentially function in some sense like government because they can. There's, they, you know, there's, they impose a lot of rules on their employees. Right. You know, so you know, things like non-compete clauses, you know, make it difficult to basically 
you know, like there's behavioral code, all kinds of things, you know, mm -hmm. things that you have non disclosure agreements, you know, so there's a lot of, um, um, so, so I would argue that there's a definitely another degree of power that comes with like being a big employer and yeah. then, you know, potentially like using your, using your, uh, you know, your ability, you know, it's the sort of like the, it's the kind of the argument you always hear when people talk about job, the job creators, you know, yeah. like we have to, we can't do anything because the job creators are going to, Right. You know, they're the ones who are like, you know, are, are giving you, letting you in so you can have your money, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of like, and I think that's, you know, with an absent, absent based income, this, it, it, it does kind of work more or less like this. Yeah, I see what you're saying. The amount of power they have over a large number. They have a large number, yeah. like a lot, and you know, essentially they have, totally. you know, you have to, you know, you know, I know, I mean, people will say, well, you can always go for get another job, but, right. you know, a lot yeah. of other companies work for, or work exactly the same. Yeah, you know, yeah, they have just as much, I would say, unaccountable power that they shouldn't have, I think. Yeah. And I guess that's the spectrum, too, as a worker. Like, workers are lumped together, but people with a lot of bargaining power might not might feel more like a professional, even if they work. Yeah. Because you can work for Amazon in the warehouse, or you can work for Amazon for, like, 200 k a year in stock options because they want you as, like, a high-level person. And that's going to yeah. feel more like being a professional than it is a worker, even though you technically work for Amazon. So yeah. as the workers' experience is different depending on their bargaining power. Yep. And some people have very little, like, because they have a basic income, they might almost have none. And then it kind of, like, it's a spectrum up, up to the top. Yeah, yeah. another one yeah. would be, you know, academics. You know, you're, right. you're, you're, you work for universities, you know, you they yeah. tend, tend, you know, tend not to want to think of ourselves as workers because it's sort of like, you know, socialize that way for start. Yeah, right. But in reality, you know, it is there is still, you know, you are still employed by a, a institution. It's true, yeah. And pay a wage. And I guess you're not self employed. That's why most employed. lawyers and stuff too, they're not usually self employed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and then there's the, you know, kind of like where do you draw the line between being self employed or, you know, like if you have a client, are you an employee or right. a client? You know, yeah, that kind of thing. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have like, do you have, well, uh, you know, because that's that's my people want to see that position, you know. Like I, we have clients, and they I don't think it's my my bosses, but they are. It's like you have a lot of micro bosses. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, right. you know, um, it's just that no one boss has you know necessarily a huge power, uh, huge right. power over you, and you, right. you know, you're, you're as in a contract, you're free to essentially do things the way you want. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, they're free to. But to, to some extent, right. we've drawn you know arbitrary legal lines, you know. In terms of who's a who's a worker, who's an employer, who's a yeah, who's a yeah. contractor, you know that. And it's more messy than that. Yeah. Well, and just from an economics perspective, it's all continuous, continuous right? Yeah. You know, someone so, pays you to do something, and that's part of you know yeah. the labor market, right? Yeah, right. whether it's like yeah, whether you're a um, 1099 receiver or yeah. versus a W two right. employee. Right. Like exactly. a CEO is technically also a worker. But obviously, like they're like if they're a CEO of Coca Cola, yeah. their life is very different from like a worker. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. volunteer people who are volunteering are they, are they workers? Well, no, not according to the law. But right. you know, in terms of like, are they doing work for someone? Yes, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next one. Yeah. Basic income is simplify that. Right? Yeah. My my hope is that with basic income in place, we can start to simplify some of the, some of this legal stuff. Yeah. Um, the the labor market in terms of like being fair to workers and like. You know, that's the way people are expected to get their income is going to be a lot less important. So maybe the uh, regulation of it is going to be less important, at least, at least in some dimensions. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do, do. Contrary to what many believe, then, American political parties are not very responsive to voter preferences. The, their candidates are fairly free to say one thing to get elected and to do another thing once in office. This contributes to confusion and apathy in the electorate. It leads to campaigns where there are no issues except images and personalities, even when polls show that voters are extremely concerned about policy issues. You don't raise unnecessary issues during a campaign, one successful presidential candidate once said. I guess this is a matter of like your standard of comparison. Um, I'm a little bit like skeptical about this, but I think I mean we do see uh, political candidates overpromise. That's yeah. really, you know, like oh that was just a campaign promise or something like that. Right. You know, like, we kind of take that for granted. Like with Trump, he said, 
Um, Mexico is going to build the wall and things like that. Yeah, promise things that other people are going to do. Yeah, but that yeah. wouldn't be the key yeah, evidence. Other countries. <laughs> that wouldn't be the key evidence I'd bring to bear on this point. Like, I'm more, I would be more persuaded by the evidence Alex was talking about in that paper, like these strong preferences and then how do they really how it actually happens. Because I think right. overpromising also is there to signal the general values of the president, for example, and like what they're going to try to do. And right. it's kind of like an understood thing that they're going to pro like promise what their optimal would be, but then they don't actually have the power. To do that, you kind of want to know. Is necessary, yeah, the compromise is and they're not actually going to be able to do all these they're things. They're going to promise what they're going to fight for. Yeah, what they're going to fight yeah. for, not uh, what they're actually going to achieve. Like with all the Democrats saying we're going to get rid of Citizens United when you have to get a... Constitutional amendment. Uh -huh. right. Yeah, so that requires a lot more than just a president wanting to yeah. do it. And so yeah, it's kind of what they want to fight for. And, and people argue that that's the case for Trump too, that like people... What he was really saying is like I'm going to be kind of like anti-immigration pretty strongly, and to that, to that end, he's done what he can. I think I'm not a great caller of politics, but my sense is he's basically done what he could do yeah. to be anti-immigration. So like that's listening to the quote-unquote voters, if that's what the voters that voted for him wanted. So so I guess my point, the point about overpromising doesn't seem quite on point to me. But I think it's yeah. it's true that that they're not respond. I mean, I think partly it comes down to the fact that yeah, they're not responsible. They aren't responsible for their preferences, partly because of the problem that they're kind of identifying in this paper, which is that is that is that when they're actually in office or like you know like a senator, they're enmeshed in these other systems of power and influence, and they have other people. You know, like, I mean, the, the classic example in my mind is like the amount of time we have to spend getting money to get reelected, right, right. and you end yeah. up like, and it's again, it comes back to the socialization thing. You're spending all your time talking to people. In the financial sector, whether or not you actually agree with that going in, mm -hmm. you're That's just gonna you're yeah. spending time with you listening to what they're saying, you're adopting yeah. that worldview. Yeah. And so it may be that that's where the um, you know, so so someone might be you know, voted in, but then they just spend so much time on on uh, you know, or you know, they have their their, their legislation is written by or at least collaborate with like you know lobbyists and stuff like that, that kind of thing. So, and, and I think that's right. I think I think what he's saying here isn't that the politicians are necessarily um, being dishonest about what they're fighting for and what they want. He's saying that um, you know once they're uh, you know elected, uh, the power like like Alex was saying, the power structures are such that it prevents them from. Uh, uh, being responsive to to what yeah. the what the people want, and I guess all I would say is like most of that might be something we see. I see the problem, but some of it is there by design, like like just the fact that there are checks and balances, and it's like hard for to get things done. That's partly so that you don't elect like a president on a populist sweep that helps fifty one percent of the population by murdering forty nine percent of the population. You know, like there there, is, there are these other issues. Case. Yeah, there are these other issues with like pure majority rules democracy that the, even the founders foresaw and tried to build it in a certain amount of slowness and responsiveness to help to deal with that, I think, in part. Doesn't seem to be working out right, <laughs> yeah, well I mean, right now. <laughs> well, it could, just, you know, could always be worse. But, yeah, I mean, but I, I guess I'm just adding that in as another reason that you don't, yeah. get, you don't get the responsiveness you might want. It's, it's, it's yeah, no one can like, change it over things overnight. Yeah, like, and that has its upsides as well as its downsides. Like, it's, I was reading something recently about how, like, um, and I hadn't really thought about this, like, you know, so most of the candidates are talking about, uh, you know, the Democratic side about the Medicare for all, which I would support when you are going to have to get there. But they were saying, making the point that even in countries that have it, they move from a mixed system mm. through a series of things until they got to gradual something. Gradual change. Yeah, yeah, so there was a gradual change. Yeah. So you, even even when you, even Denmark or whatever, like, right. didn't, didn't start out with, like, they didn't magically make... Single pair happen in one yeah. legislative yeah, session. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and that's got to have, in addition to like political reasons, that's got to have some practical benefit too, because like it's hard to like succeed at a big change sometimes, just institutionally. Yeah, yeah. To just do a whole new thing and like it's a huge shift, and then like so many mistakes are going to happen just in Well, there's so many, and, this, and I think this yeah. is why it gets very difficult when people like this is why it does make some people, some fractured people, nervous who do have like say really good health care. Um, right. And it's hard to, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it goes back to the same thing about how you convince a power elite to, right. to change their mind when you've got this thing that, you know, I, I like it the way it is. Right. It's working for me. I don't yeah. really want to change that thing. But, yeah. but, you know, then you have to get them over the hump to say, like, yeah, but once you get there, 
it'll be better for everyone. It'll be lower cost for everyone. But right. it's like it's hard to. It's hard. To yeah. And there's like the risk part of it too. Like if you make, it's kind of reasonable to assume if you make like a drastic yeah. shift, a lot could go wrong. Things could end up worse. Like that intuition isn't so irrational. No. No. Um, and like kind of goes with what you were saying about other countries gradually. Transitioning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think it's one thing to say, "Hey, the government is now going to start providing this thing," and it's another thing to say, "Hey, the government is going to start providing this thing, and it's now illegal for you to have this thing that you have now." Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's got to be a way to phase <laughs> yeah. things in, right? Yeah, yeah. phasing things. Even yeah. like when we look at the history of different like democracies, like the U.S. already had like a lot of local democracy before they went to like bigger picture yeah. or like England those steps were kind of gradual like you know like these things often don't work so well when it's like an attempt at like a giant sweep even if we want the change to happen quickly you but know, I think the point the, when something. there's so much pent up demand for that change though and right. then when you know when it does come a sweep there's a there's a tendency to want to have it all happen at once and it's sort yeah, of like, it makes sense, like the power elite was smart they would be like like we would just just get it done so we don't have something that you know basically sweeps away the whole system. Yeah, and then you end up worse off than you. And then you end up, and they end up worse off, but you know, that's And everybody can end up worse off, you know, not right. even just well, like often the yeah. most vulnerable people, the poorest people, end up the worst worse off. Like in the case of like big revolutions and stuff, when you have yeah, so it, it can end up pretty pretty bad. Like with narcotics, that um, people, well, politicians just sort of want. Are against marijuana. If it, most politicians are against marijuana, but and Yang is like for um, magic mushrooms or whatever, and marijuana and heroin and things. And he's not legalizing it. He's not for <laughs> he's heroin, heroin per se. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to decriminalize it. Yeah. He yeah. wants to make it cause a problem, and he has a different idea about how to address the problem. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah right. I bet some of those issues are ones where like the populace is different from the like what's happening politically too. Like, yeah. I, I don't know though for sure. Yeah. In the like the, um, the Netherlands, they they when they legalized marijuana, it made it uncool, and so <laughs> most people don't. The, the, they're not as yeah. much users of it as they were funny. beforehand. That's funny. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have guessed that. Um, it's so illicit. It's not as illicit as it used yeah, to be. Yeah, right. It's not like you can show off your like danger, you know, <laughs> your risk seeking danger stuff. I wouldn't have thought that that was a, a big driving force behind why people used marijuana in the first place. I don't know either. Yeah. Like, maybe it was. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, definitely that's always a component, like that you can get it. Maybe you have certain kinds of social oh, connections true. that you can, you're willing to use something risky. Like young people, especially young men, do a lot of like risk taking to show off. So. I guess I'm not shocked post hoc, <laughs> but, I, but I, I wouldn't have expected either because I would have expected yeah. the other things predominated. But, but. Like with all these, like a, like cigarettes, they before they were, um, well, for the whole like late '90s uh, case where well, they sued the cigarette the cigarette manufacturers, the like tobacco or whatever, right. they they. Um, there were all these programs where they were smoking, and then after that, they stopped showing these programs, and so the cigarette con- content went down, and there was no oh, like sales TV, of it. TV shows? Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Uh, so Eddie has a few comments. Um, first one is, given the effect of compound returns naturally uh, tend toward concentration of wealth, Progressive forward movement, such as UBI, is absolutely necessary to prevent the calcification of class divisions. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. Wait, can you summarize them? I'm not sure. So I think what he's saying is that compound interest that you get mm-hmm. on your investments, uh, the rich people get richer exponentially, I see. right? Uh, and there's no way for everyone else to catch up. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, Piketty's argument. Yeah, the R, R is greater than G, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I see. Yeah, I am not... So let's see. If there's no basic income... Yeah. I see that happening. Yeah. I would, I would agree with that. If there isn't something else. <laughs> Yeah, if, there, if there's no basic income, then um, then yeah, the I mean like 
I guess you have to. So there's no basic income, and the mechanism that we're using to get money to ordinary people is just like a tiny trickling out from this exponential growth mm -hmm. that all the rich people are getting. So I think that's right. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that it, it leads to or reinforces class division, or that it has to. Um, I think I think some of that. Well, yeah. I guess I guess if people are moving further and further away from each other in wealth, you're you're more likely to have uh, boundaries. Uh, the ring, the rungs of the ladder, yeah. getting spread out far and more right, and more. Right, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah, sort of, you know, like, 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 uh, gated communities and, yeah, you know, yeah. um, um, you know, private, private sort of police and fire departments and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, I think I do agree with this. And I, and I think basic income does help here because even if you have a basic income and the rich are getting, um, you know, uh, increasingly rich exponentially, um, the basic income would allow you to have better public departments because through the taxation. That's not what I was going to say. Um, but the basic income certainly um, allows people to have agency in their lives and choose to live how they, they want to live. Um, you know, the rich might not necessarily be as interested in, in keeping out the rabble if, if, if you know, the people, you know, the poor people aren't really rabble anymore, that kind of thing. Um, and then there's more um, economic, potential economic mobility as well and social mobility um, because you are not just dependent on, you know, jobs or money trickling out of the financial sector for, for your income. You're less, you're less dependent on um, the, the, the powerful elite to, to do what you want to do. Uh, so that gives you more, I think, more flexibility to even become become wealthier or find find ways to make money and, and compete, that kind of thing. And there will be yeah. smaller private prisons or no private prisons at all because the people wouldn't have, have a need to go to do risky things that would end up with them being in prison. Yeah, I mean, it's less about private prisons and more about um, there might be fewer prisoners. There there would be less crime, you know, that kind of thing. Um, there's some interesting incentives with private prisons and, you know, um, you know, they want to have more prisoners in order to be able to profit and that can create some perverse incentives, that kind of thing. Like they're bribing judges to have more people in prison. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know that basic income fixes that on its own, but I think by, yeah, by virtue of the fact that, uh, Lower recidivism. Well, yeah, I mean, by virtue of the fact that people aren't going to have as much of an incentive to, to commit crimes in the first place, mm -hmm. it's going to be harder to uh, get judges to send as many people into the private prisons. It also could make a big yeah. uh, effect just ge geographically because right now there's this sort of tendency of, you know, jobs cluster in these, like, you know, or the you know quote unquote good jobs tend to cluster in these like you know global cities or like right. like you know the coasts or whatever where you know and then there's you know, sort of essentially wealth is being taken out of a lot of the you know the, the these hollowed out you know rust belt places or whatever and that with the basic income a lot more stuff could come back and yeah. that that may that will have all these implications for like what you're talking about like 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 you'd have fewer places where um, it will become no go zones or whatever. Mm -hmm. Brain yeah. drain. What's that? Brain drain. Brain drain. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I, I think that's basically right. Um, yeah. Let's go into Eddie's uh, next comment. We're a little behind in the comments here. Um, Thinking fast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, productivity growth. Or wait, da, 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 yeah. Productivity growth also tends to benefit the business class first. A kind of trickle down effect, putting the wealthy in line for benefits first, and workers slash normal people in line uh, for benefits only indirectly through uh, through businesses. Yeah. Um, so I guess. I mean, I, I'm imagining an ideal economy in which. Uh, productivity growth or growth in production 
uh, means um, there's growth in consumption too. Like it's two sides of the same coin. So everybody, everybody kind of wins, the, the producers and the consumers. Um, without basic income, yeah, without basic income, you have to, you know, people are depending on the, um, the employers in order to get their income. So if you, yeah, without basic income, if all you do is increase labor productivity, then the thing that automatically happens on its own is that workers get paid less. So people get less income. Like, that's the natural thing that happens. Uh, you're not going to have higher output because higher output requires consumers to be spending more money, and the opposite of that is going to happen. Um, so you need, to, you need to find a way to boost the incomes back up again. Um, and the way we kind of do that is, is through, uh, um, it's through the financial sector and through the labor market. Like uh, businesses borrow to create jobs and those jobs are not productive in the grand scheme of things. And the businesses that are hiring those employers are not producing anything useful in the grand scheme of things because we stimulated the financial, we, we did it as a way of getting money to consumers. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's great. Right. And then if you have a basic income, uh, you're not going to have this problem because you can calibrate the basic income uh, to activate the economy's uh, full productive capacity. Yeah, that's right. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, Michael says, are compound returns related to product productivity in the economy? And Eddie's response is not necessarily. Those are separate ideas. Uh, two different effects that will tend to calcify class division in the absence of effective intervention. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. Um, compound returns are are not really related into it, to productivity, uh, except in the sense that if you actually do have a financial se sector that's all about real investment, um, then uh, in order to provide an incentive to invest, there needs to be some kind of return on, on that investment. Um, yeah. Um, do, do, do. Okay. Um, anyone have any comments before the next quote? Let's do a quote. Yes, this is a quote. <coughs> so, do you have any sort of super highlight ones? Because you'll hear about 10 more. Yeah. Not gonna get <laughs> I, tried, right. I tried to put them in order of priority. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know. The upper class and the closely related corporate community do not stand alone at the top of the power structure. They are supplemented by a wide range of nonprofit organizations that play an important role in framing debates over public policy and in shaping public opinion. These organizations are often called nonpartisan or bipartisan because they are not identified with politics or with either of the two major political parties, but they are, they are the real political party of the upper class in terms of ensuring the stability of society and the compliance of government. Yeah? I'm not totally sure what he's talking about here. He's talking so about flesh the, this out. the dark money stuff. The, like the Koch brothers, like weird nonprofit things? Found, you know, like yeah, like weird foundations. Think tanks. Think tanks. I mean, some yeah. of this is like overlaps with like some, I mean, he, he talks about the Ford Foundation, which is like a much, it's not really a dark money organization, but I think, I think he's right in that there's a sort of a, Overlap between sort of like you know the classic like dark money, super PACs and that kind of thing, and then have their own through, priorities through to, through to these other sort of like more traditional nonprofits like Brookings Institution or the American Enterprise Institution, all these yeah. you know which are ostens some of them are ostensibly partisan, some of them are not, but they're but they do act as a kind of like, uh, and I think this is this is what I think is most interesting about the paper is that they talk about. Like, like, I think most people, if you just ask them about the power elite, would be you know, clearly identified, obviously, government and the upper class, or whatever they call it, they, they identify corporate power. But this is kind of a little bit different, because it's yeah. not as well known, I think, but it does exist. And I think it's, I think it's right in saying that there is a way in which, because you get like people who, I mean, example I'm thinking of is like people who work in, you know, government, you know, there's a revolving door, they go and work for some foundation that then lobbies, creates legislation on behalf of, you know, for the government, but then that, 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 that non-profit or whatever is also got, it's partly funded by some, right. you know, organization that's, that's that, that's, who benefits from that government policy. And right. so you get, so you get like the, you know, the obvious like lobbyists from an industry going in, that's kind of, you know, that, but there's this, all this kind of penumbra of these other yeah, organizations really that are kind yeah. of like, that you know, they're all around Washington. They're sort of the beltway. They they sometimes 
I'm not quite sure it's the same thing, but I've heard this term, the Beltway Bandits. Huh. I think that's mostly um, the, the defense contractors, but there's sort oh, of like yeah. the sense in which there's a... And so I think that's kind of what he's trying to get at here, is this idea right. that there's like these other organizations that... And also because they draw from the same ranks mm. as the... Um, as the sort of as the politics and as the corporate elite, they sort of have that same world. revolving yeah. door. Yeah. yeah, the revolving door is part of that. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. okay. So good. that's kind of my anyway. That's my interpretation yeah, that of what this sense. is about. Yeah. And then something here that that um, that strikes me as important is is just the um, the influence that they have over public opinion. So. Let's say the government is doing what the public wants, but what the public wants is all, you know, based on, you know, the propaganda that comes out of, yeah. of you know, of these types of institutions. Yeah. I guess one thing that comes to mind for me is that there are, like, a lot of very difficult problems that the government needs to solve. And there is a role of expertise. Like, it's impossible for a voter to know enough about any of these topics to really know what to do. And so, like, nonprofits, like, I don't know, what if, I don't even know the name of a good nonprofit. That would be like the right, maybe the Academy of Sciences or something that would be the right people to turn to for like climate change science. Like your average person can't know about climate, like so, so how do you tell the, I guess Yeah, the it's not like a bad, I feel like it's not, it's not as you're saying yeah. it's a bad thing per se, mm -hmm. but just that there are these, they are, that they important. do have power. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Whether or not they're, you know, totally. they're um, using it for good or ill is, you Yeah, know. yeah, and I guess what I was going for is like, going towards is that it's hard maybe to tell the difference to like, between the ones that are kind of really are somewhat neutral or like just trying to provide information and the ones that are much less about that, um, which is an issue yeah. for being an informed voter or whatever. But, yeah, ones yeah. that are more, less transparent about their, their sort of like their, their sources. Yeah, yeah. So they may have, they have, you know, that they often will have maybe stated goals and there's covert goals. Right. And right. It's that might not even be like conscious or explicit or like explicit. Uh, yeah, and then even or, below yeah. that it's like yeah, yeah there's <laughs> the kind of like the sort of like the worldview that you inherit kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And um, yeah. but uh, but yeah there is a role for it. I agree, totally role yeah, for expertise, really but um, yeah. and it's not necessarily bad that you know you need to have people in these in organizations and they you know yeah. but yeah it's like they are they definitely do there is part of this that's reinforces, I think, the status quo. Joe yeah. Heinrich at Harvard talks about the diff like different kinds of power. Um, he divides some of it into dominance and prestige. And like dominance is basically like you have some sort of coercive ability or whatever, and so people have to do what you want. Yeah. Prestige is like people actually have something they want to like learn from you or get from you, and that's its own kind of power, but it's not really coercive power. So that's like an interesting division, and it kind of maps onto what I was thinking about. Like they're, It's kind of hard to know with these organizations like kind of mm -hmm. what their motive is or like mm -hmm. are they getting power because they have a respect they have a reputation because they've done a good job and like we want their information this kind of like prestige power versus maybe something else yeah, yeah anyway. right that can be kind of a helpful distinction for me yeah, yeah true cool. so we are getting toward the end here no more quotes no more quotes. No more just quotes. one, just one. Just 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 one. one, one, one more quote. Yeah, one more quote. <laughs> All right, we're gonna bring up one more quote. <laughs> make sure it's make sure it's the best quote. Yeah. I'm making sure it's the next quote. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So nice. there we go. Great. Final quote. Uh, the rich coalesce into a social upper class that has developed institutions by which the children of its members are socialized into an upper class worldview. And newly wealthy people are assimilated. Sure. So this is just a mechanism by which power yeah. perpetuates itself. The ruling class oh. perpetuates itself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's go around and get people's final thoughts. Bethany. Um, this is a really cool discussion. I like this article that had a lot of interesting things to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually don't have a lot to add. I feel like I sort of summarized my big picture in the beginning. But I like thinking about Alex. This is this Alex's point about you know, the practicality of implementing a basic income in the context of these different power structures that already exist and how you do that. Yeah. Yeah. Alice? Yeah, this is great. I mean, now I have a copy of this book that a friend of mine gave me, like, now I'll go back and want to read it, but um, it's almost like I've read this article, so I probably <laughs> know it all anyway now. But um, yeah, I think it's, and I, yeah, this is sort of, it's good because I articulated some of the things that I've been thinking about sort of how to get to basic income and some of the pitfalls or not the pitfalls of the income itself but just you know like what what we're up against so to speak with getting something in place and this guy's this article did a good job of kind of like laying it out and uh, even though it doesn't mention it anywhere um 
but it does help. I think it, it, it helps anyone who wants to create a basic income, you know, should probably be thinking about this sort of stuff, at least, at least once you've kind of got the mechanism, do so you talk about the mechanism, like how, how, do you, how do you go from having it as a sort of hypothetical thing to something in the real world? Yeah. Because no matter what, no matter how it comes about, you know, we have to deal with this. And then on top of that, so like, you know, and, and, and I think it's important to have the, the right theory of how it actually works. And, yes. um, you know, and I'm not saying he's got it all right. You know, there's definitely things I disagree with him on, but I think kind of it, my, my gut feeling is it's kind of got this, this, the right ballpark. Yeah. 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 Richard. Um, the world is a far more messy place in, a lot of academics and things and people like that have it, make it out to be, and you have to take it in a, into account all the different variables that uh, will make it messy in the first place, and you have to um, have to make create different the correct incentives to make to well incentivize people to do the right thing like um with like like yang was saying like you have to incentivize um like the financial and the healthcare and all these different industries into doing the right thing uh, rather than doing the well the wrong thing, but for for the correct profitization or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think everything you're saying is right. That um, not only do we have to take into account, um, you know, the important variables that are determining, you know, how how our society works and how our economy works, uh, but we have to be smart about knowing which assumptions to make, which variables are the right ones to pay attention to, and what do they mean and you know, we need to have, you, you can't just look at the world and say, oh, this is bad, let's fix it. Let's declare that it's fixed or something like that, that we're not going to do that anymore. You have to understand uh, the system or you have to have some kind of model or theory for, for how it all fits together in order to, to come up with a reasonable um, approach uh, to how to do things. Uh, so Eddie on the live stream says, uh, 1930s is a great uh, case example of the last time wealth in inequality was as high as it is now, uh, leading to populism and eventually change, but also quite a bit of conflict uh, on the pathway to change. Well, there was that thing. That yeah. thing. Right? <laughs> it wasn't the same thing as that. It was that tip of the tongue. The great something. Yeah. And then the other and then, thing. Yeah, like. And, the one was something else. Adolf something. Yeah, yeah. In power. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, yeah, so uh, this is a great discussion, you guys. Um, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think basic income um, will have profound effects on, on the power structures in our society in a good way. And, and, and my sense is that if people understand how it works, even most of the people who are in power, um, it's going to be something they feel positively about. Even if they know they're giving up certain uh, forms of wealth or certain forms of power, um, you know, I think you know, it creates a benefit it, everyone benefits from living in a prosperous society. Um, so my hope is that we can we can um, uh, we don't. My hope is that we don't have to under under like violently undermine existing power structures in order in order to get a basic income into place. I think we can um, convince the powerful that, that that there's something useful here uh, for them to 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 look into. Uh, so. Next week, uh, we are we have a special guest. Uh, Carl Weierquist is a philosophy professor. He's going to be here in person, um, and he's going to give a talk. He's been involved with basic income for forty years, over forty years. Oh yeah, you remember you saying this. Yeah, um, and um, so he's going to give a talk on the history of the basic income movement, uh, and we can ask him questions. Um, I haven't added the event yet, uh, but I will. Uh, and uh, the other important thing to remember is that it's going to be on Saturday at 2 p.m. So Saturday, March 7th at 2 p.m. Um, and so we might have a different room if there's a lot of interest in the same building. Like we'll we'll be somewhere around here. Yeah, yeah. but if it's a lot of people. Yeah, I stumbled on this article that he wrote. 
and I think I posted it on the yeah. on the group, and I was, and then you said, "Oh, by the way, he's going to be yeah. here." <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, cool. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Right. It should be neat to to view. I met him once. We yeah. were at the Boston Big Thing Come March in New York. Oh yeah, he was at that. He was. Oh cool. Yeah. I clicked that. Yeah, right. it should be really so he's been involved.